There's a food crisis in Africa right now, but odds are you probably don't know much about it. It's in the Sahel region in West Africa, and it's receiving very little press. For most of us, it can be hard to keep track of the different crises, from hurricanes to floods to famines. And maybe we're expecting government to do the work. Or perhaps there's a more troubling explanation. Perhaps we're experiencing donor fatigue and we're becoming numb to the suffering that we're seeing around us. We're going to hear from two Christian development agencies, but first, let's learn about the food crisis in the Sahel. Farming can be challenging at the best of times, but when you live close to the edge, as many people do in parts of Africa, drought can push you over. That's the situation facing over 18 million people in the Sahel region in West Africa. Drought and erratic rains have crippled harvests, leaving many people hungry. In some areas, crops that did grow were almost completely destroyed by an insect infestation. Les trois repas ne sont pas assurés. C'est peut-être un repas qui est assuré pendant les périodes de crise alimentaire. L'autre élément, les crises alimentaires, c'est aussi la perte des biens. La perte des biens, c'est quoi En période de crise alimentaire, les populations vendent tout ce qu'ils ont. Ils vendent ça à des prix vraiment très bas. S'ils ont des chèvres, la population, les gens vendent leurs chèvres pour trouver à manger. The Canadian Food Grains Bank and Development and Peace visited the region. They saw that there was nothing left from last year's poor harvest, and the cost of food at the market has more than doubled. Development and Peace is responding to food needs in the Sahel with its Caritas partners throughout the region. Likewise, the Canadian Food Grains Bank has committed $10 million of assistance to help 278,000 people in the region. With the next harvest not due until October, this emergency assistance is saving lives. Communities are participating in income generating activities, receiving food distributions, and being given seeds to plant for the next harvest. But more can be done to address the root causes of hunger and help prevent future food crises. You can help people in the Sahel. By donating to the Sahel Emergency Appeal, you are providing much needed assistance for people in the region. To learn more, visit the websites of Development and Peace and the Canadian Food Grains Bank. Joining me now in studio is Jim Cornelius from the Canadian Food Grains Bank and Josiane Gauthier from Development and Peace. I had the privilege of traveling to Africa to see this crisis myself. But before I went, I was vaguely aware that it existed. And now that I've come back and, it's, and I'm thinking about it, I've only seen maybe a number of ads on television, very little press. Why do you think this crisis has gone under the radar? I think it's gone under the radar because it hasn't turned from a crisis into an emergency where you get the, the terrible images of, of emaciated children and those sorts of things. Um, it's a very deep crisis. There's a lot of suffering going on, but it hasn't moved all that way yet. And so until those images come out, sometimes it doesn't get picked up by the media. There's also the fact that we're, uh, we're on the tail end of another crisis in East Africa just a year ago. Mm -hmm. And um, in the public mind, there might be a bit of confusion about whether this is a new crisis, a new situation, or whether it's just an ongoing uh, constant situation that they've already responded to or uh, they've already moved on from. And what was the response like for both of your organizations? Uh, the government was, until the end of August, uh, matching donations to, to both your organizations. How did the public respond? It's going until end of September, I believe, uh, the matching. Um, I don't know, usually the, when the government offers such a matching fund, it has a stimulant effect okay. on the, the public mm -hmm. uh, donor um, who sees this as encouraging because, well, I'll do my part and the government will do theirs. Um, so it has helped some, but it's obvious that the fact that there was less media coverage made that a lot of people were not sufficiently aware of the crisis. So um, we did 
get some funding, but uh, from and donations from the public, but nothing in comparison, for instance, to the image to the donations we got in response to East Africa last year, when the images were so uh, terrifying. Mm -hmm. Was that the same for you, Jim? Yeah, it was the same situation. When it's not as present in the media, uh, an announcement from the government, um, a few people notice, but it mm -hmm. doesn't really get doesn't get the currency um, sort of in the broader sphere. So it's much harder to get that message out, and also. People still respond when their hearts are touched, and there needs to be a variety of ways in which that happens. So simply a, you know, a formula for a matching, that's not enough to sort of move people. Um, it, it's helpful, but people do need to sort of feel touched by the situation in, in some way. Now, when I went to, to Niger, I, I saw your organizations doing fantastic work and, and feeding people. Is um, is it difficult to, to touch people's hearts when the needs are successfully being met? Is there sort of an irony in that if, if you're doing your jobs well, it's actually harder to, to receive funds? Prevention is very hard to sell. Mm -hmm. um, I think we did a wonderful job working together, actually, mm -hmm. the, the collaboration we had between the Canadian Food Grains Back and Development and Peace was, was very fruitful. And we were able to respond to needs before they became critical and mm -hmm. uh, where famine was was really the, the only uh, way going forward. So we were able to get people some help ahead of time and we're very proud of that. But we do understand that it's very hard to to sell, uh, if you want, um, the image of success or the fact that we are succeeding in, in preventing worse uh, disasters. I still think it's a challenge for us to communicate the stories of individuals and to make them real. Um, People still respond to the story of a person. Um, I think when I was in Niger in May, um, we were in a you know in a community, and we've been able to share the story of a particular woman and the fact that there was still three weeks away before she was going to get food, and this woman was in deep, deep trouble. And so, I think there are ways we can communicate this story, but it also becomes part of our obligation as Canadians to be able to say. How can we look at the deeper issues? How do we stay engaged in the long term? Don't just depend on emergency appeals, but look at what we're doing and how we're supporting the work of agencies for the long term and making sure they have the resources to respond, even when it doesn't get in the media. Mm -hmm. Now, are you having to look for different ways to, to communicate this message? Because it seems like these food crises are happening more regularly. I know that in Niger, we were, we were told from the local partner from Caritas Niger that the crisis used to be, you know, maybe every every 20 years, then down to 10, 5, and now it seems every few few years there's a crisis. What do you have to do to ensure that that when we hear about this so often that the public just doesn't tune out entirely? People need to feel connected. People need to feel not just a sense of pity or, or uh, shame uh, in, in the face of someone else's suffering. They have to feel connected to that other person and feel if we can work together all the time, then this person need never suffer. Mm -hmm. And that message is a very difficult one because it's one over long term. It's, it's education, it's, it's solidarity, and these are emotions that we have to go in and um, revive in people. Mm -hmm. Make them feel proud of how well we've managed to, uh, to to respond to somebody else's suffering, just on a human level, not just, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to go hungry to suffer. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to make people feel proud that they were part of that solution, that's the messaging we have to strengthen. Well, I want to ask you more about what your respective organizations are doing in Niger. Uh, part of what I saw was not just aid, but development. And we're going to look at how Development and Peace and the Canadian Food Grains Bank, working with Caritas Niger, is looking to rehabilitate some of the lands that had been previously lost and not able to farm. Let us know your perspective. Email us at perspectives at saltandlighttv.org or reach us by mail. Perspectives at Salt and Light Television, 114 Richmond Street East, Toronto, Ontario, M5C1P1 or call us toll free at 1-888-302 7181. Let your perspective be heard. Abdu, we huh. can see that there's some plants growing behind us, but uh -huh. over here there's nothing. Why can't anything grow right here? Ici, la terre est dure. Elle ne permet pas à l'eau de s'infiltrer. Tu vois comment elle est? Mm. Toi-même, essaie de voir oh, okay. comment ça donne. Okay. Uh -huh. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, it's very hard. Ah, tu vois, non? Yeah. C'est dur. Donc, l'eau ne peut pas s'infiltrer et une plante ne peut pas grandir comme ça. Donc, il faut de l'eau pour que la plante grandisse. Mm. Et ici, l'eau ne s'arrête pas, donc on ne peut pas planter. But over here, we can see plants are growing very well. Um, what, what was the solution that allowed that? La solution, il faut permettre à la plante de trouver de l'eau. Et pour que la plante trouve de l'eau, il faut la stocker. Mm -hmm. Et pour la stocker, il faut creuser le trou hein, dans le sens contraire, en fait, perpendiculairement au mouvement de l'eau, mm -hmm. pour permettre à l'eau de rentrer et ici stocker et permettre à la plante de grandir comme ça. Là, elle a l'eau et on a fait un apport de fumier des, des excréments des animaux qui ont permis à la plante de bien grandir vite. Là, ça permet à la plante de grandir vite, tu as vu oui. Comment c'est Voilà. I'm back with Jim Cornelius from the Canadian Food Grains Bank and Josiane Gauthier from Development and Peace. Now tell me about your working relationship together and how you work with uh, local partners uh, in West Africa. Well, the Canadian Food Grains Bank is a partnership of 15 Canadian churches and church-based agencies and one of our member agencies is Development and Peace mm -hmm. and so we work very closely with our members and with Development and Peace and um, in fact we are a bank. They have an account in our bank mm -hmm. and when um, Catholics donate to the Food Grains Bank they're encouraged and invited to make their donation designated into the account of Development and Peace and then those resources are available for development and peace to use in a situation like this in responding to crisis. Now is this a, uh, being a bank, is this a little bit different setup than many other NGOs? It is because we don't actually deliver programs on the ground. Okay. The programs on the ground are being delivered by our member agencies, development and peace, and in many of the cases, uh, such as theirs, they're then working with their partner groups on the ground. And so we are a resource for them. We provide financial resources, but we also sh provide technical support in these crisis areas, procurement support, people provide technical advice. And um, so we're, uh, we're a support to the network of churches and their work around the world. And Josiane, your, uh, your organization would naturally have have a close link with Caritas Niger being part of the, the Caritas umbrella. Can you describe this? Development and Peace is the actual Canadian Caritas Agency. So we are all sister organizations in one confederation, which is Caritas Internationalis, based in Rome. Um, every country with a Catholic Church has a Caritas. And we all work together. So when there's a time of emergency, there is a whole network sit, set up so that we can collaborate. If the emergency is happening in one given country, the local Caritas partner will be the, the first actor on the ground and we will it'll be our privileged partner the person we want to work with the most in that situation because they are based on the ground it's their home it's their people and um, and this works quite well there there's uh, we were talking about it Jim and I I mean there are advantages and disadvantages but the human factor the the that special ingredient of working with people who are at home in their own environment is is something that's uh, quite precious in, in this type of situation first of all you can act fast um, and people know the real needs um, they understand the local culture they are dealing with realities that we can barely grasp mm -hmm. and they uh, they can help us to to measure and adapt the project uh, according even to regions within and sub-regions within the country so you can't use one uniform program and um, this is a very precious uh, tool we have when we have the local Caritas partnership. Now you've had the privilege of, of actually going and visiting the local partners and seeing the work that they are doing. I know you went uh, to Africa during the, the Horn of Africa crisis and you were recently in Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. um, what's that experience like for you seeing it firsthand? Well you always want to have a sense that you know how is this this long what looks like a long complicated network of us working with with development peace and then with Caritas what does that look like out on the ground in a community in a village somewhere and so when I was just in, Bur in Burkina Faso I was able to go out to um, to one of the communes my great commune see a food distribution talk mm -hmm. to local mm -hmm. beneficiaries talk to the farmers see how the whole system works so you have that sense that it's getting there because in public meetings you know usually uh, one of the most common questions I get asked is does the food actually get there and so this is a way of assuring yourself that this this network that we believe works very well is in fact working well and it's the benefits are getting to real people and you can talk to there's them. a concern among some people that that it might not that it might the money might get what caught up in a bureaucracy 
there's a lot of bad press about mm -hmm. uh, humanitarian aid in general and development aid, and it's that's another challenge in communication for us is to get across the fact that it does work. Um, yes, there are challenges. Yes, it's difficult work. Yes, there's a lot of complexity to getting this done right, but it does work, and we have to tell that story a little bit more. For both of you, it's it's very easy for you to feel connected for your consciences to work um, on this level for these issues because you've you've gone there and you've you've seen it. Um, how do you how do you work, uh, particularly with Christian communities, to to help develop their consciences and and make them aware that this is part of their Christian responsibility? That's part of our work, and we do um, ongoing education work as well mm -hmm. as uh, develop long-term development work in in many countries where there's not a crisis, and. We also do emergency relief work. So we try to tie that all together mm -hmm. so that people understand that there are different stages in life. Mm -hmm. um, you can be in crisis at times, and at other times you just need friendship, and at other times you just need to listen. Mm -hmm. And so this is part of this continuum of, of, uh, of being somebody who's uh, led by their faith mm -hmm. um, to just be called by the humanity of the other person. And that is our responsibility as human beings, as Catholics, as other Christians, or anybody actually, mm -hmm. is to be called on by the, the humanity of the person in front of you. And you are, you are not so different. Mm -hmm. You have to respond. You have to listen when the person is speaking to you. And in a, turn, in a time of crisis, somebody's speaking, and you should listen. And so if there's any way you can respond, it's not always a donation. I mean, sometimes it's something else. Maybe sometimes it's just you talk about it to someone else, and you've done your part. You've contributed. This is, um, this is the challenge, getting people to, to act at whatever level they can, mm -hmm. and to accept that whatever actions they pose, that counts and it contributes. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that we have to do more is, is tell the story of the people we meet in mm -hmm. the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about the beneficiaries, but I'm talking about the actors, the people mm -hmm. who, who take those, those difficult jobs in, in the Caritas agencies. These are all, many of them are, are faith-led people. Some of them are not Christian, some of them are Muslim, because these are highly Muslim countries in the Sahel. But they're working for a Christian, a Catholic organization, because they believe in the human values. They share them with them. And they are themselves affected by the crisis. They, they may have been displaced. They may have uh, had to cut back on their, on their purchases, on, on, on getting uh, enough food to the family. Maybe they have to give all their salary to their extended family who's out in the countryside and not being able to farm. They are personally affected by the story, and yet they continue. And they are there early in the morning and late at night getting this food out to people, getting the grains out to people, and writing reports to us, and on n overnight phone calls to us to make sure everything's OK. So it's, it's those people I want to talk about as well, not just the beneficiaries on the end, but the people who are actually these silent partners who are doing the, the work. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we'll be a part of that. Uh, Salt and Light Television is producing a documentary from our time when we visited the Sahel, and we will be sharing some of those stories of, of the people that we met. Now, for, for both of you and, and for me, we're, we are bombarded with different needs out there in the world and different concerns. How, how do we discern when and where to give? And, and how to give. What are some principles for discernment? I mean, I, I do think that, uh, well, as Christians, first of all, and I think well, this is one of, the, one of the parts that makes our job easy, is when we're talking to Christians, there is a part of our faith is that we reach out, and that person there is my neighbor. So, so it makes it a lot easier than talking to the general public, in fact. And the statistics show that those who are in regular church attendance give substantially more than those that don't. And, um, and then when it comes down to it, you know, there's lots of good causes out there, mm -hmm. and we're not elbowing each other out for our cause only. It's where does your heart, where is your heart touched? Where do you feel the passion for the mission? And then, and I think you need to follow the heart. And then you need to, in addition to that, then, you know, do your due diligence to make sure the agency or the group that um, that is doing the work is doing it responsibly and is doing it well and has thing in place. And so those are the two things. And you, as an individual, you're not going to solve all the world's problems. So you, you know, allow your heart to be touched, allow your heart to be moved, and then work with some, you know, some judgment too in terms of which groups you choose to partner with. Mm -hmm. I guess it's not easy work, this discernment, but maybe it's not supposed to be easy. No, no. and we, of course, as organizations, we have all sorts of policies and <laughs> principles that we're supposed <laughs> to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that probably accounts for half of the judgment call. Mm -hmm. And then there, we leave space for the human factor, for mm -hmm. us to feel 
Um, is this the right time to intervene? Do we, do we think that, basically, do we think we can make a difference in this case? Mm -hmm. And then there's sometimes, um, there's a heightened responsibility. In the case of the Sahel, mm -hmm. we knew we probably wouldn't raise much money, but we had a responsibility to speak out, to be mm -hmm. witness to a situation which was not getting any voice, not getting any noise, and we said, we're here to speak out. We're here to talk about the situation. So sometimes it's not about the result uh, in terms of money or funding, yeah. but we made a difference just by speaking out about it. As the Food Grains Bank, one of the things we're blessed with is um, donors that give to us generously, undesignated, not in response to appeal, so that we have lots of money in the bank, so that we can respond to situations that are not in the media. And we look at the end of our year and we want to say, did we allocate our resources to the areas where there was the greatest need? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily where we raised the most money, but because of um, this long-term support from Canadians across the country means that we have those resources. So we could respond very early. We were tracking this crisis right after the harvest failure, mm -hmm. starting to put in place plans, committing very substantial dollars, and then we're also blessed with um, a very substantial funding agreement with the federal government that also is in place early. So those funds are in place early, allow us to respond without having to wait for it to become an emergency. So all of this helps a lot. Well, hopefully Canadians will respond such that uh, crises won't turn into emergencies and won't turn into famines. Now that's all the time we have, but as always, we give the last word to, uh, to the Word, the Word of God. And it's a passage from the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. In those days there was a great crowd without anything to eat. Then Jesus ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground and he took seven loaves and after giving thanks he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute and they distributed them to the crowd. They had also a few small fish and after blessing them he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and were filled and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Final thoughts, Josiane, on that passage. The passage says a lot of things, but um, the first thing that jumps to mind is uh, sometimes we can feel overwhelmed by the uh, enormous nature of the task at hand, and we can feel discouraged ahead of time, thinking there's nothing I can do to help feed all those people. Um, but I think that that passage teaches us to just have faith and to do what you have to do, and somehow you do manage to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Jim? It also speaks to the fact of sufficiency. Well, sometimes we think there isn't enough. There is, in fact, enough food in this world for everybody to eat a, three good meals a day. And, um, and then what the scripture says to me is we need to have that faith to make sure that everybody gets to share and gets to sit around the table and share the food together. Well, we hope that our viewers have been, been engaged and want to learn more about your organizations and how they can help, particularly the people in the Sahel. Uh, how can they learn more? visit our websites. That would be a good start. Um, ours is uh, www.devpdevelopmentandpeace.org. There you can find out uh, there's a special page on the Sahel. Uh, we keep it updated regularly with blog posts and information. You can comment our blog, encourage us, tell us what kinds of stories you want to hear, um, and also learn about the rest of the work we do in the organization. And Jim? Similarly, the, our, our um, web page is probably the quickest way we have regional coordinators across the country that their phone numbers are on our web page and you can invite them to come out to a church gathering. They'll be happy to come, make presentations, talk about the work, share stories, and, um, and you can get involved. Well, thank you both for, for joining us and for sharing your, your perspective today. And for all of our viewers, we want to hear your feedback. You can go to our Facebook page. It's linked from our website, saltandlighttv.org. That's all for tonight. Thanks for watching. <laughs>